How many folks here have actually uh, tried layer? Okay, so the lower half-ish. Okay, other folks, okay, well, you know, at some point you'll get your chance. Uh, of those folks who've tried it, how many thought it was just like the most amazing thing ever? Okay. Ooh. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and how many people said, you know what, this is kind of interesting, but it also kind of sucks. Right? I don't know. For me, I, to be very honest, that is kind of where we're at in the augmented reality industry, which is there's stuff out there, I mean, Saunders stuff, right? Really cool. And when you see it, you go, wow, I didn't know that was possible. But then there's the, you know, the, the as Martin called the where is layers. Where's the nearest Starbucks? Well, I don't really need an icon floating in augmented reality to show me where the coffee shop is. That is not what it's about, okay? Now, just because it doesn't feel like it works very well today, uh, doesn't mean that it isn't going to be important. In fact, uh, and Bruce, you said this last year at the <laughs> AR you conference. You again. <laughs> direct quote. Yeah. Speaking of AR people, you said you guys are the world's first pure play experience designers. And what he's talking about is we're designing for the real world, right? Digital stuff, interactive stuff that's happening in the physical world. And I, I would actually take it a step further. I think we need to stop thinking about this as being a division between physical over here and digital or virtual over here, they're really starting to come together. I mean, this notion that they're like two different realities, the word augmented reality is almost going to disappear itself pretty soon because, you know, get used to it, the world is going to be filled with digital content and digital interaction and it's going to be an integral part of what we experience around us. You know, today we're just starting to see the first little glimpses through our little magic windows. So. If we're going to design experiences for the real world, we need to start getting good at it, right? And today, we're not that good at it. I mean, there's not even that much of a theory out there about what it means to design experiences for the world. What makes a good experience in the world where it's mediated by digital stuff, right? This is, you know, some, some work that was done by some colleagues of mine at HP Labs a, a few years ago, probably, uh, I think it was maybe 2002, 2003. Um, looking at uh, locative media experiences that they designed and trying to come tease out what were some of the interesting um, aspects of why people would say, wow, that was cool, wow, that was compelling. And they came up with this dimensional model. There's kind of three you know, main uh, axes of this. I don't know if this is right or not, but at least it kind of helps us think about it. There's a, a dimension of stimulation, both physical and mental, and mental, right, emotional. And you know, okay, so we're in the physical world, there should be physical stimulation, that makes sense. Our brains are here, mental stimulation, that all makes sense too. Um, there's also a dimension of kind of challenge, either the, the challenge of solving a problem or physically exerting yourself, or even just the, the challenge of expressing yourself and being creative, right? That makes people feel like if they got to do that, that that was actually a good experience. And the other key dimension that they found was uh, the social dimension. And that could either be in a competitive way, like you're playing a game competing against other people, or it could be in a cooperative way where you're working with somebody or you're bonding with people. But having people, having challenge, and having that kind of stimulation of your mind and your body uh, all together were things that were common threads across lots of experiences that people said, you know, this is actually good. You know, there's, some, there's some good work. Um, Mihai Csikszent Mihai is a, a social psychologist who did a bunch of work. He's known for this concept of flow, uh, really trying to understand what is optimal experience. And, and flow is kind of that top triangle here. It's, you know, when you have a challenge that actually, it, you know, it pushes you but you're still good enough that you can kind of rise to that challenge. And so you kind of get into the zone, and athletes get into the zone, computer programmers get into the zone, designers get into the zone, when things just seem to flow. And I think that's part of what we need to do. Now, today in AR, do things flow? Mm, eh, not so much, right? But I think that's where we need to go, right? Is how do we actually make good experiences for people? Okay, so there's no theory. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff empirically. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that kind of seem to work in some situations, just as a way to give you some, some clues uh, as to what I've been seeing anyway. 
Uh, and I'll kind of go through these. Zero click experiences. Uh, I'm holding up my magic window. Don't make me get in there and kind of click a bunch of dialog boxes and navigate around. Show it to me, right? Show me the hidden world. Uh, narrative. Tell me a story. It doesn't necessarily have to be a long story, even though it would be really cool if it was, right? I think there ought to be long form AR experiences, but you know, tell me a story, even if it's like a five second story. Engage me. Uh, magic moments. Um, give me something where I, I'm kind of going, huh, huh, huh. oh, wow, I'd never thought of that before. That really surprised me. That confused me. That caused me a moment of uh, just, you know, insight, revelation. Again, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, but something. Uh, I'll show examples. Um, a lot of people in AR, especially as they come out of the research domain of AR, are all about this, how do you get graphics exactly positioned in the right place on the world, right? They call it, you know, sort of registration of graphical features with the physical world. And there's a ton of great technology work going on around computer vision to try and recognize images and objects in the world and then get stuff to overlay precisely. And you know, that's really good and that's really cool, but mostly that stuff is not really quite ready for prime time yet in the mobile world kind of see it on your desktop in the webcam thing. Um, but also, that doesn't necessarily lead to a great experience, right? So you need to think about what are the techniques that allow you to create a sense of immersion and a sense of flow that might actually be different than give me the thing exactly where it happened because I knew the lap long down to six significant digits, right? That's not necessarily the thing that gives you the best experience. Um, and finally, a lot of people have said, and, and I've actually been one of them, that this whole notion of mobile AR, holding a device up in front of your face and kind of doing this, seems like a really dorky thing to do and an, an asocial behavior. And, you know, it occurred to me, I see people doing this all the time, but what they're doing is they're taking pictures, right? If you think of this as a camera, then holding a device up in front of your face, mediating reality through a screen, and kind of pointing it at people and kind of doing whatever you're doing, right? That's a very natural behavior that people are doing with their phones already. It's called photography. And now when we're taking videos, we're holding it up even longer and we're looking and we're laughing and waving, right? So it actually occurred to me that one of the interesting things about AR is that if you thought about it almost as an inverse of photography, then suddenly it doesn't seem so unnatural anymore. Um, and in fact, one of the things I've been finding myself doing is when there's interesting AR content out there, I take pictures of it, right? I'm actually kind of taking photographs of the hidden world. So there's kind of a use case going on there that's emerging that is, um, yeah, it wasn't what I had expected. I hadn't thought about it as I'm taking pictures, and yet, you know, boy, well, I've, I, I take pictures all the time and I share them on Twitter and, you know, they're photographs, except that they're photographs of weird virtual objects hidden in the physical world. In fact, you can, you can kind of get crazy, right? It's like you can take pictures of virtual objects that were uploaded to the internet and then put on your mobile phone and then put them in a layer and take pictures of them. And I just did that to Martin at the In-N-Out store the other, a couple hours ago, and it was weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so, you know, we're creating a medium here, but it is early days. We don't have a vocabulary for what does it mean to create our AR, right? What's the equivalent of the establishing shot in film? What's the equivalent of character creation and you know development and, and on and on and on and on, right? I mean, we need a language and you guys get to help to explore what is the creative language of the AR medium. All right, so some examples. Uh, Okay, Martin showed this one. One of the things that seems to work, uh, there are a lot of people out there with historical archives, photos uh, from the past. This is a photo from 1906. It's actually a still, still image of a video taken going down Market Street in San Francisco. Turns out a couple weeks before the huge 1906 earthquake that destroyed most of the city. And, uh, and working with one of our development partners, we got a layer built to show not only the images, but also actually play the video in situ when you're on Market Street today, right? So you've got this 
zero click interface, you pop it up and there's the image right there. You don't have to click, you're just looking at it. You can kind of go, wow, you know, old world, new world, really cool, right? Old photos are almost by definition a narrative. They tell a story, and especially ones that are really dramatic, right? And you know, this is a little bit about the choice of content. If you say, okay, this is a photo from 1906, I'm seeing horses and buggies and old Model Ts and stuff like that, there's some drama, right? It's not a huge story, but it kind of leads you somewhere, right? So these are historical photos actually work really well. Um, I, I met a, a journalist who's actually uh, on a Knight Fellowship at Stanford, and he came to me. He knew I was into AR. He said, hey, you know, I want to figure out how do I do journalism in AR? And, you know, to make a long story short, what we did was we got a project going to take um, historical archival photos from the Stanford archives, and he told a journalistic retrospective story about events that happened in the Stanford Quad over the course of the last century. And again, this is a photo from, you know, pre-1906 earthquake, and there was, I don't know if you can see it, in the, in the photo that's kind of put up there like a 3D billboard, there's a big monumental arch that you don't see in the background there, right? And that's because in the 1906 earthquake, it was destroyed and it was never rebuilt. Um, and what Adriano, the journalist, found was as he dug into it, there was this whole story about how Jane Stanford, one of the founders of the university, uh, had gone on this big building craze, you know, got a bunch of money, built all these great buildings in 1905. They just got them finished, and then the earthquake came, and because they were built with substandard building practices, they almost all collapsed, were destroyed, and no longer exist. So there's this incredible hidden story just in the landscape of, you know, what is otherwise, you know, a normal college campus. Um, and the archivists are among the most passionate people about AR because they immediately get it. They don't kind of go, uh, you know, this sucks, I don't get it. It's not, no, I want my archives in AR now. The big problem, of course, is historians don't have a lot of money, so how do you get this stuff going? So it's actually, for us, it's really important to create tools that allow individuals who are not wealthy, who can't hire developers, to actually get in and be able to put this stuff up themselves. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of the democratization story. How do you make it possible for people to tell their stories? And they have incredible stories, right, in, in this new medium. Okay, so others are, you know, statue that fell down, embedded itself, you know, in the sidewalk during the earthquake, and now is back up on the wall, you know, outside the building there. And it's just, you know, kind of startling when you see it. Uh, you know, Condi Rice, you know, who's you know, now back at Stanford at the Hoover Institution, greeting Medvedev when he came to visit Stanford. And you know, this actually launches a little video where you can watch them walking through the quad. And if you're standing there, you're like, wow, look at that. They're walking through, and I just saw that place where I'm standing now. And that's actually what I mean by a magic moment, that moment of recognition where you went, wow, the thing that's happening in the virtual world suddenly just kind of came completely in focus and aligned with my actual reality today. And it gives you this little frisson, right? Um, so another one, I mean, you know, historical photos are everywhere. The city of Philadelphia has like 90,000 historical photos. And they actually got a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and hired a team to, uh, to put all those 90,000 photos up into AR in Philadelphia as part of this phillyhistory.org project that they've had, and so that people can go in the streets and they can actually kind of visualize. And one of the things they're exploring is, so what makes a good experience in seeing these things? Should your, should, should your images be partially transparent, or should they be opaque? Should they be sort of aligned at the right angle to match up with the angles of the streets and the buildings so that they kind of represent the, you know, as exactly as possible the reality? Or should they just kind of be facing you so that when you're nearby you can see it and get the story? And this is a little bit what I mean about immersion and communication versus exactitude, right? I mean, if you, if you put the photo in a, in a way that it exactly lines up with the angle of the street, but if you happen to be standing way over here on the side, you're going to look up and you're going to see this thing and it's like looking at a billboard and it's kind of receding in perspective and you can't really see it. Is that a good experience? You can make the guy walk over around so I'm 90 degrees to it so I can see it. That's not necessarily the best experience. So you really got to think about, you know, what's happening on the ground in people's lives, not just what is technically correct, right? 
Have you discovered uh, best practices for that? Um, it's still kind of. You know, it's it's it, this is all happening real time. I mean, they just you know launched their project in Philly about uh, three months ago or less. Um, you know, the, the Stanford project kind of went live in January. So this is all. I mean, we're trying to figure this out, but you know, I'm, I'm giving you kind of what I know almost in real time, in some sense, right? Which is, you know, situationally, sometimes things work better one way than the other. Like the Stanford project. Um, you know, if the quad is a pretty big quad and it's got buildings all around it and, and technically you can know where these pictures were taken for various events like, oh, the ROTC march was over here and, oh, the bombing of the president's office was over here. But you don't necessarily want to make a person wander around a big quad trying to find the pictures. We actually settled on trying to make it more like a, a museum gallery. We would put the photos kind of approximately where they belong but then put them in a row side by side, um, and then when people look, they say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're like paintings on a wall. I mean, I can't see the wall, but I can see the paintings. I know what to do. I just walk to the next one and check it out. So it's providing some kind of an affordance that simplifies navigation, improves that people can actually kind of experience the stories without being slavish to, oh, the six digits of accuracy of GPS, which if you play with GPS for very long, you'll find out it's not very accurate anyway. So you might as well try and make things better for the user. Work with the constraints as opposed to trying to fight the constraints that you can't solve. Okay, um, the Berlin Wall, right? This is a 3D model of the Berlin Wall recreated right in the center of Berlin as a way to show people what was it like to have this you know, opaque object, this huge monumental thing dividing up your city. And this is the kind of thing along with, you know, models like this of the World Trade Center that people find very resonant. I mean, there's a really strong emotional story there. Uh, you know, and of course, in the US, this is one of the most emotional stories that you can tell these days. Um, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that goes beyond just, oh, it's, you know, interesting media, oh, it's interesting 3D models. You're actually touching the people. You're starting to move them emotionally. And you know, that's a good sign that we've got a medium that actually could be meaningful, right? It's, you know, something like this grabs people, okay? So I think that's another thing we need to look at is, you know, how do you really reach people? How do you really communicate with them? Not just make cool things, make cool designs, whatever, right? It's like, you know, get, them, get them in the gut. Um, you know, the, the social stuff, Twitter. Actually, I'm gonna go to a live demo at this point. Let's see. Yay! More, more fun to do live demo, right? Okay. Right. So, He's courageous. He's risking the live demo. Yeah, look at that. At ARE, he started his presentation with a live demo. I could not believe it. I, I don't no, do live are. demos. Boy, I do. That's all. Uh, well, you know, that shows you how much faith I have in post-PC computing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a anything that has, like, a public API and geocoded data can be put into AR. And, uh, okay, now I'm... Uh, it's getting results. It's getting results. Hey, I've got Wi-Fi. I've got good connection here. No, it works just now. I did it on the Wi-Fi. Ah, there they are. Okay. All right. So this is. You guys know Goala, right? Okay. So so Goala has Goala spots around here. Run, run for your life. Duck. Goala Zilla is here. Yeah. All right, so you know, this is a really simple where is layer. It just so happens, you know, it's a nice rich data set because Goala has lots of spots. And you can go in here and check into the Goala spots and stuff like that if you want to. That's all, you know, well and good and kind of cool. And it's a, it's a nice demo to show your friends. Um, but there are more interesting things to do. Uh, I do like, uh, everybody here know what Instagram is? Social photography on the iPhone. Uh, you know, you take a picture, you have these old time filters and stuff like that. And it, by the way, it also uploads to the internet and geocodes where you took the photo. And so they have an open API. And so this, this is an Instagram layer that pulls in photos. Wow, that's a huge one. It must be right on top of us. Um, <laughs> okay, but you know, you can see these are photos that were taken, you know, well, April 27th is a little while ago, May 10th, May 13th. They're a little further away, but then, you know, here's, I, here, there's one I took of Martin in the library just a little while ago. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Right? I mean, now it starts to get more interesting because there's social content and 
there's stuff that's relevant to your context that's happening kind of in real time. So I like this one, even though it's still stuff kind of floating in there and it isn't always people I know, I like the Instagram layer. In fact, I was saying earlier about taking pictures in AR. Um, what I like to do is, you know, here's, here's this photo of Martin in the library. Well, Select layer it. has this screenshot function, right? This is uh, a little known feature. So now I'm, I'm using layer as a camera now. So I'm gonna take a picture of the picture in AR. You can figure out how many levels deep that rabbit hole goes. <laughs> and then I'm gonna share it. Um, you know, hello. So this can be done in just the regular app, maybe that this has is, on their iPhone, and then it'll show up. You can download, yeah, download it right now. Instagram app, do it. take the picture, it shows up there, yeah, all right. Let's see. Oh, you know, I'm not logged in, but if I could go and go through the process of logging into Twitter and Facebook, which you know you, you can do when you set up an account on this. You can add your location, and you can actually have that go out onto Twitter, and they'll see that photo up there. It'll be shared on the web. So now it's like, okay, you're sharing a photo on the internet of an augmented reality view of a photo that was taken and shared on the internet. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what is that, right? I mean, there's something really interesting to explore just in that design space, this kind of you know, receding hall of weird reflective mirrors. So, okay, uh, let's see, what else? Um, free space, okay, so Martin showed the video of like the guys in white suits invading Bruce's talk and- Spacelib.org. You know, space liberation, whatever. Uh, well, one of the things that this crew has done is they've created an open layer that people can put stuff up in, um, and it's called free space. Well, okay, surprise. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, they, they said, okay, you want an account? I said, yeah, I want an account on that, right? So I go in there and I start putting stuff in there, and they've got some artworks that people have uploaded, images and stuff like that. This is still getting results, getting results. Um, but in theory, oh come on, oh the, real, oh the reality of the internet, no content available, how could this possibly be? We're going to give it one more chance, because you know, it was working in the library. Yeah, it just now works. Yeah. yeah. The library's a free zone, man. Yeah, whereas this, I don't know, this is still a space that needs Controlled to be Controlled by the man here. Student slavery zone. <laughs> All right, all right, uh, well, I'm going to give up. But the uh, I'll show you a picture of that instead in a minute. Uh, well, if, if that's Office. not working, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead and go back to, okay, so there's that Instagram layer. So this is what I was trying to show you, okay? So, you know, people are starting to put things like protest images up, right? So uh, this middle one is actually a, a another version of the thing that I actually put here near the art center. It's a stencil that was done by a street artist in Hong Kong. Uh, her alias is Tangerine, and it protests the detention of Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, who's been in prison now for you know 45 days for crimes unspecified against the regime. And, uh, and, and somebody took that stencil and turned, made a transparent PNG of it, and now it's in AR, so you can put that stencil anywhere you want to. Well, somewhere out here in the environs of the art center, there is an Ai Weiwei protest stencil floating there waiting for you to find it in three space. You know, is this interesting? Is it good? Is it uh, effective protest? I don't know. I think if we got to a world where everybody shared a view of augmented reality and then stuff like this showed up, I think it would actually be a really good, valid, and interesting medium of expression. And people should tell this. But you know, I looked on a map and it looks like there are, th there are these protest photos also in Hong Kong and in Beijing. And what happens if somebody in the Chinese government kind of figures out that you know, there are layers out there that have you know, free Ai Weiwei in there? It's like, they take this stuff fairly seriously. And, uh, you know, over there, it's like if if you're a person who's looking at this stuff through a phone and you happen to see something that's offensive to the government, you might be detained just for looking at it. 
So are we putting people in danger? If a layer of, if Martin goes over to China for the next big conference and he goes through the airport, I'm not going. Oh, you're from Layer, excuse me, sir, come with me. Right? I always say Layer's my fault, and then if that happens, I don't know. And I don't we're like that. We're going to have, you know, free Martin Lenz Fitzgerald in VR or something <laughs> like that. Anyway, so uh, baby. some thoughts about design practices, some ideas about where this could go. Uh, I think one of the things that we're hoping you guys will do is take this and go way beyond, right? Take these very initial, very starting ideas, this very sort of silent film days, and you know, kind of figure it out, take the next step, you know, help us forward because we're just making this up as we go along. All right? Questions? Thanks. Thanks.